Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the worship of First Christian Church. We welcome those of you that are here in this worship space. We also welcome those who are joining us online in whatever worship space you're sitting in this morning. We are all God's children and we unite together in spirit and as we worship God together. <coughs> Those of us that uh, are able to attend here in person and get a chance to uh, greet each other either before or afterwards. And we invite those of you who are worshiping with us online to greet each other through the chat uh, on Facebook Live this morning. But again, welcome to worship and let us begin our worship as we listen to the morning prayer.
joining me in our gathering prayer. God of grace, you have given us minds to know you, hearts to love you, and voices to sing your praise. We seek to experience your truth, to receive your blessing, and to rise above the limitations we have known. Clear our minds, open our hearts, and touch us with your presence and your power. Amen. Please be seated. <laughs> Our scripture this morning is 1 John 3:18 through 24. Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. This then is how we know that we belong in the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive him, from him everything we ask. Because we obey his commands and do what he pleases. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commands us. Those who obey his commands live in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the Spirit he gave us. Amen. <clears throat> we now have an opportunity to share joys and concerns with one another as a community of faith and also to take them to God in prayer. Two weeks ago, um, Amy and I were worshiping in Prince of Peace United Methodist Church in um, Elk Grove Village, uh, Illinois, where uh, Amy's brother and, and sister-in-law have, have started attending since uh, Sherry Lowley, uh, our sister-in-law, uh, retired as Methodist pastor. We, uh, we enjoyed worship that, that morning, and I uh, thought it was a little odd after the service. Uh, people were milling around, uh, uh, greeting one another, and I didn't see the pastor. I wanted to say hi to her. And um, then as we were getting in the car at the parking lot, uh, the rescue squad showed up in an ambulance, and it turned out that Pastor Robin had had a stroke uh, at the very end of the, of the service. And um, she is, is recovering, but uh, Sherry Lowley, uh, Amy's sister-in-law, has uh, come out of retirement to uh, fill in there for, for the month of July. So I ask for prayers for Pastor Robin and her family and for Reverend Sherry and her family and for that uh, community of, of faith. Are there other joys or concerns that you wish to share with us? Yes, Anna. I just want to thank everybody for the cards and so much and much support. It means a lot when you, you know, uh, you know, get that kind of thing. Mary sent me two. So. <laughs> <laughs> she forgot she can't first. <laughs> but I do appreciate all the cards and the bottom. So I wasn't as communicative as I should be. But. Anyway, thank you, everybody. <laughs> thank you, Tana. It's good to see you up and around. And if you have any new dance steps to teach us, we'll, no, uh, we'll gather in the narthex after. Somewhere about walking upstairs. Yeah. Yes. I'd like to give an update on Micah, uh, Sheila Hunter's son. 
He was riding his bicycle home and was hit by a drunk driver. And um, he has had three surgeries already. Um, he had a collapsed lung. His left leg, I believe it is, is just about crushed. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to have to put all kinds of metal rods and so on in the leg. Um, there is a GoFundMe page for Micah. Um, I, he and his wife are newly married. They don't have a lot of insurance. And this is going to be a long, long, long process and very expensive. So if you see the GoFundMe page for Micah Hunter Small, please um, help out if you can. Sheila is up there. Yes, yeah, Sheila she is up there. She um, staying with Micah and his wife. Yeah, she'll be there till August, at least. And we pray for, for that whole family and for the medical folks taking care of them and for his healing. Yes, Elsie. I have a joy. I was so excited. It rained in my house last night. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I know that it rained here in Black Mountain, and I know that it rained you just over a mile from me, that it kept skipping the house. Mm -hmm. And last night, we got rain, and I mm -hmm. prayed, and I said, thank you, Lord. We do good. God, thanks for the rain and the sunshine. Yes. Yes. I have joy and mainly a concern, but uh, my brother-in-law died last Sunday, and so we had this funeral on Friday, and it was a joyous event. Lots of people. I saw three first cousins I hadn't seen in 50 years uh, there, but I pray especially for my sister. This has got to be a very tough time for her, particularly financially, because he was still working. We do pray for, for your, your sister and her family and for all who, who gathered in, in uh, your brother-in-law's memory on Friday. Yes, Brenda. I just got a text from a friend asking for prayers for her friend in Charleston who's had a, a recurrence of cancer. Pray for a friend of a friend, all who are battling illness. Yes. I would like to ask for prayer for all of the elected officials and the appointed officials. We're in a mess. We got to get them straight. We do pray for all, all our elected and, and other government officials. Please vote. <laughs> <laughs> Let us join our hearts in prayer. <clears throat> Loving God, we gather as your holy people, hungry for your word, longing for your presence. Breathe your spirit into our lives and empower us to be your witness for peace in the world. O oh God, in the death and resurrection of your Son, you have given us a new freedom. Help us not to waste this opportunity to share in this life of love and devotion. This week, we also pause to reflect on the blessings of this nation and the freedoms that have been handed down to us. As we remember that these freedoms have come through the sacrifice of others, help us commit ourselves to offering the freedoms we cherish to others. Don't let our pride of country keep us from seeing the needs that still exist in our land. Where there is hatred, help us bring your words of love. Where there is injustice, Help us become advocates for the voiceless and powerless. Where there is apathy, help us to bring the good news of your gracious, transforming love. We also pray for the concerns of our hearts, for those mentioned here this morning and those that we hold silently now. 
We pray for our loved ones in whatever their circumstances. Dear Lord, help us to slow down, look around, and see you in every waking moment of our day. Speak to us now and send us into your world as renewed followers of Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name as we join in the prayer that he taught, saying, Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. We have the responsibility of bringing life to the world around us through our ministries and the outreach of missions through our connections of faith around the globe. Let us offer gratefully and sacrificially to the work of God, the work that God has given to us all. I invite you to stand and sing our doxology. Thank you. 
We offer our gifts to you, O Lord, knowing that you can change the world through the offerings we make. Take these gifts and use them, multiply them, and bless them for the work of your kingdom. We offer these gifts in the name of Christ our Lord. During the weeks that I was away, the lectionary had a series of readings from the Book of Acts. Uh, it's not uncommon during the Easter season, uh, between Easter and, and Pentecost, but uh, I wasn't here to be able to preach on those, and I did notice that none of the guest preachers chose to preach on the passages from Acts. So for at least a couple of weeks, we will be uh, going back in, in time in the lectionary to uh, uh, look at a couple of those stories from Acts. Today we read from the ninth chapter of Acts. Meanwhile, Saul was still spewing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest seeking letters to the synagogues in Damascus. If he found persons who belonged to the way, whether men or women, these letters would authorize him to take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. During the journey, as he approached Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven encircled him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice asking him, Saul, Saul, why are you harassing me? Saul asked, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, came the reply. Now get up and enter the city. You will be told what you must do. Those traveling with him stood there speechless. They heard the voice, but saw no one. After they picked Saul up from the ground, he opened his eyes, but he couldn't see. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and neither ate nor drank anything. In Damascus there was a certain disciple named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision. Ananias, he answered, yes, Lord. The Lord instructed him, go to Judas's house on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias enter and put his hands on him to restore his sight. Ananias countered, Lord, I have heard many reports about this man. People say he has done horrible things to your holy people in Jerusalem. He's here with authority from the chief priests to arrest everyone who calls on your name. The Lord replied, Go, this man is the agent I have chosen to carry my name before Gentiles, kings, and Israelites. I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Ananias went to the house. He placed his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord has sent me. Jesus, who appeared to you on the way as you were coming here, he sent me so you could see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, flakes fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. After eating, he regained his strength. He stayed with the, with the disciples in Damascus. For several days. This is the word of God for the people of God gathered this morning. Last week we started with a theological question asking whether our understanding of God was true or false. And in last week's reading from John's Gospel, Nicodemus discovered that to understand Jesus' message of good news, he had to come to a new conception of who God is and how God is acting in the world. 
Nicodemus had to radically shift his understanding as if he were born anew. Today, we consider how gaining a new understanding of God results in a new understanding of people, a new way of seeing others and relating to them. Both people we encounter in the ninth chapter of the book of Acts have their eyes opened to a new way of seeing. But first I want to talk about two other men whose true story is told in the book and later in a movie called Same Kind of Different, of different as Me. Ron Hall and Denver Moore tell their story, they're co-authors of the book. They had one of the most unlikely friendships you could imagine. They were about as different as two people could be. Denver was an African-American man living on the streets of Fort Worth, Texas, a former sharecropper from Louisiana. He had served time in prison for trying to rob a bus driver at gunpoint. Ron was a, a banker turned successful art dealer. He, he and his wife Debbie had two children and lived in a 15,000 square foot mansion in the country. Debbie convinces a very reluctant Ron to join her at a downtown mission where on this particular day that we see in the movie, they volunteer to serve the noon meal. One of the people they encounter is an angry and violent man named Denver Moore. At first, he is suspicious of their motives. Later, uh, after many encounters, after they've become friends, Denver reveals that his past had made him believe that all people were all white people were racists and ready to break into violence the moment he stepped across the line. This was his lived experience in many experiences during his life. Well, their relationship began as the haves sharing with the have-nots. It soon turned into a friendship between equals. When Debbie was diagnosed with cancer, Denver pours out his heart to God, praying for her healing. Her death was the catalyst for Ron and Denver to become more like brothers than friends as they take on the project of raising money for a new downtown rescue mission in Debbie's memory. Each man discovered something in the other that he needed something God had put there as a surprise gift, one that could only be discovered when one of them opened himself to a friendship with someone as different as they could be. The story in Acts 9 is often remembered as the conversion of Paul. It's the story of when Paul, the persecutor of the early church, became Paul, the apostle, missionary to the Mediterranean world. But Saul isn't the only one who changes in this story. The other character, Ananias, has his own new awakening. His eyes are open too. And like Saul, he gains an expanded vision of what is real and what is possible in God's eyes. God often places people in our lives that we might not have chosen as friends on our own. Maybe you've met someone in your own life who is different from you in background or beliefs or in some other way. You may not have sought them out, but God gave you a chance to receive the gifts God placed in them. Ananias and Saul were natural enemies. Saul had stood guard over the execution of Stephen, the first Christian martyr, and one of Ananias' brothers in the faith. 
And Ananias is told to go and lay hands on Saul in healing prayer. It's no surprise that he objects, wondering if Saul will instead lay hands on him in a different way. God, you can't be serious. Everybody's talking about this man and the terrible things that he's been doing to your people in Jerusalem. Now he's shown up here with papers from the chief priests that give him license to do the same to us. Ananias' fear was justified. He was being asked to minister to a terrorist. He was called by Jesus to offer the light of God's love to a person who was set on extinguishing it. But that's exactly what Jesus does. He draws us out of ourselves, out of our fear, our suspicion, our prejudice, and takes us into the world for the sake of others. God assures Ananias that this Saul is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. Only God knows how God can use someone, no matter how lost or antagonistic they seem to us. <clears throat> God is full of surprises. Saul will become Paul, an apostle whose witness will forever change the spread of the gospel around the world. We should keep our eyes open to those around us, asking if God has called us to enter into an improbable friendship. After all, the most unlikely friendship that could have, been, that could have developed is the one between the creator of the universe and us, as his creatures, who could imagine that the son of the creator would long to become our friend? Ananias and Saul saw, show us that the God who can call us to put aside our differences and to serve God together. Sometimes that journey is not safe or peaceful. It can be disruptive, it's intrusive, and it places us into positions of vulnerability, where we're required to trust in the power and goodness of God. To follow Jesus is to go where Jesus goes and to take up his cross. And, it, and it's to begin seeing others the way Jesus does. It's easy for me to love you and for you to love me when we see eye to eye on things. It's much trickier for us to love each other or even to tolerate each other when we disagree on matters of conscience and conviction. But this is exactly the kind of love that will make the world sit up and notice because it's so rare these days. We're so accustomed to people lining up on opposite sides of the street to hurl insults at each other when we disagree. Just look at many of the hot button issues swirling around us right now. In the beginning, Saul had his theological differences with the followers of Jesus, but it was his inability to see past those differences and relate to their humanity that led to his hatred of them. In confronting Saul, the voice from heaven challenges him to see them through new eyes, to see them as people worthy of respect. The title of the movie and book, Same Kind of Different as Me, comes from something that Denver Moore said at Debbie Hall's memorial service. He told the gathered friends and family how distrustful he had been of the halls and of all white people for that matter. But as he began to accept their compassion and open up a little, he said, but I found out everybody's different 
the same kind of different as me. We're all just regular folks walking down the road God then set in front of us. At the end of the film, there is a clip of real life Denver speaking to another group, and he said, we'll never know whose eyes God is watching you out of, and it's not going to be who you think it is. Sometimes, like Ananias and Saul, we need something dramatic and disruptive to occur to help us see the world, and especially one another, differently. To see ourselves as God sees us, to see ourselves as we truly are. Whereas Ananias saw only a murderer, God saw an apostle. Where Saul saw the early Christians as heretics to be silenced, Christ saw them as members of his own body. Where Ananias saw a clear and present danger, Christ perceived a beloved Son of God. A story like this makes it clear that in too many cases, we do not see one another as Christ sees us. As a, as a result, we avoid when we're called to embrace. We dismiss when we're called to listen. We cancel when we're called to engage. But the ability to see one another as Christ does is not something that we come up with on our own strength and resources. The kind of perception we see in Acts 9 is a gift that comes from above, a fruit of the Spirit. Sometimes that gift comes wrapped in a vision, and sometimes it appears in the form of an unexpected person. Sometimes it appears in a set of circumstances that put us in places and among people we would never have imagined. In whatever way that gift appears, it comes from elsewhere, from outside ourselves. In the end, this story in Acts 9 has good news and bad news for us. The bad news is that we are all like Ananias and Saul, struggling to perceive the gift of God in one another. None of us see the world or each other as we ought. Our limitations and flaws mean that we are in pr profound need of transformation so that we can comprehend one another through the eyes of God's love. The good news is that Jesus is committed to restoring our hardened, cynical hearts. He's relentless in helping us to see one another as he does. And so let us pray that the Holy Spirit would open our eyes and ears and hearts to the world around us, to allow us to act beyond our instincts and help us find the friendly love of Christ in our neighbor. Amen. Once again, Jesus calls us to the table. Here there is a place for each of us. There are many things in the world about which we might disagree, but at this table we are united through Jesus Christ, and we are made whole by this bread and cup. In God's infinite love, we have been invited to this simple meal. So come, not because any of us is worthy, but because Jesus invites us. 
Let us join in singing our communion hymn, Break Thou the Bread of Life. was betrayed and arrested, given over to the authorities, he was at supper with his disciples. We're told that at that meal he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. He gave it to them, saying, this bread represents my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. At that same supper, Jesus took the cup, and after giving thanks, he poured it and gave it to them, saying, This cup represents the new covenant, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink from it, do so in remembrance of me. Let us pray together. O oh, gracious God, thank you for your loving, healing, and grace for this table. You have given us so much, we share this table with all. Lord God, we thank you for St. Paul and his tremendous witness in the early church that is still impacting us today. Let us not be blinded by the worldly events around us. Help us open our eyes and ears and hearts to serve the people in need of our love and support. Let us be companions to all. We are invited here at this table to break bread, representing Christ's body, and drink from the cup, reminding us of the blood shed for our sins. We have received mercy from the hands of Jesus Christ. Now let us go into the world to show the light that you ask us to be to the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
to share in the bread of life. We share in the cup of salvation. As often as we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we remember the Lord's life, death, and resurrection and proclaim his ongoing presence with us. I invite you to stand as you are able to sing our hymn of invitation, Live into Hope. faithful. Let us be faithful to God in all that we do and all that we are. Let us go to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.